I'm really excited to be here today to talk about how you can use Spark and structured streaming to extract insights from your data in real time. As an engineer, I know that one of the hardest parts about processing big data and extracting insights is dealing with trade-offs. There's a lot of different kinds of trade-offs. You know, I want to use a lot of cores, but I don't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, I want to code in Scholar. I want to code in, Py in Python. I want to trade off speed for accuracy. And one of the long-running themes of Spark has been trying to make it easier for you as a developer to reason about these complex trade-offs. So to make this a little more concrete, I want to rewind the clock and go back in time all the way to the year 2009. It's a much simpler time. Uh, and big data was exploding. There was tons of data, and people wanted to get answers out of it. And what this meant was you needed to use parallelism to split up the problem and harness all of the power of a whole bunch of machines in order to get the answer. But the hard part of this is now there's a lot of complexity. I need to handle cross-machine communication and failures. I need to worry about splitting the problem up and retrying if something goes wrong. And this was the insight that Matei had back at UC Berkeley when he started Apache Spark. So roll forward to the year 2013. And a lot of people are using Spark. But what we're finding is they're spending a lot of time tuning their computation. You have to kind of make sure you're minimizing overheads like garbage collection. You want to make sure you're getting the, the last uh, inches of, of performance out of your cores, getting uh, you know, as, as many records as possible per cycle. And uh, what you really want is just a high-level language that allows you to quickly and concisely express common computations. And so this was the motivation when we created Spark SQL. The high-level languages like data frames, data sets, and SQL allow you to just quickly say what you want Spark to figure out, and you leave it up to Spark to figure out exactly the most efficient way to perform that computation. So now we, we move on to today, in 2017, uh, and there's kind of a new challenge. Data is arriving faster and faster than ever, and we're no longer willing to wait hours for a batch job to complete in order to get the answer. However, I still have these huge repositories of historical data, and I want to be able to process them with, with high throughput. And this was really the motivation behind structured streaming. We want to make it possible to both query your massive data warehouses while also connecting to new data sources like Kinesis and Kafka and get up-to-the-minute, uh, up-to-date results. So we've been talking about structured streaming for a while. Uh, you know, we, I think we first announced it at Spark Summit last year. And as Matei said, I'm really excited to say that there's actually a couple of production use cases that we've been working very closely with. So at Viacom, they're using structured streaming to read data out of Kafka and then compute uh, windowed aggregates on key metrics about video playback. And this allows them to watch all of their different properties, including MTV and Comedy Central. And if anything's going wrong uh, with, with any of the video playback, they can hop on it right away. Uh, they had a, a previous streaming setup uh, you know, before they switched to using structured streaming. And the problem was it would run great until there was a really important event, like the, the election night coverage on Comedy Central, and then it would start falling behind. And that's when you really need to be up to date, because you want to know when something's going wrong. Similarly, iPass is using it to monitor you know, many access points across the world to make sure that they're both secure and performant. So these are pretty cool, but you know, at Databricks, uh, we really want to always dog food what we're working on. And we also have a fairly large cloud platform that we need to maintain. So and this is another place where we're using structured streaming to actually watch all of the audit logs and metrics to make sure that Databricks stays secure, available, and highly performant. Uh, you know, I could talk about this all day, but what I really want to do is actually demonstrate it. So I'm going to switch over into Databricks. I promise there will be no Twitter this time, unlike in previous demos. Uh, so let's just bring this up. So here I am in, uh, in Databricks Cloud. This is a, a hosted environment for running Apache Spark. And uh, I can run some commands. I'm going to use Markdown to explain what I'm doing as I go along. But what I want to do is I want to take this Amazon CloudTrail data and access it uh, and, and extract some insights from it. So we'll do uh, historical. One source of, of Amazon CloudTrail data, so this is every single event that happens in any one of the Amazon accounts that the Databricks controls. Uh, and, and what they'll do is they'll actually dump all of this data into a huge historical archive on S3. And the nice thing about this is it's got all the data. So every single record you know, for the last three or four years is there. But it's, it's very old, and it's very slow to query. Uh, but let's see what, what Spark can do in order to make this a little bit more structured. So we'll do uh, historical. Spark read text, and I'll just load this raw data. So data cloud trail raw. 
So this is going to run a Spark job, which is going to go out to S3 and pull in some of the data. And this is pretty cool. So we can, we can see what it looks like. We can see its structure. But what you're going to see is there's only one column. And I really want this, I actually want to break this up so I can query on individual things. So as you probably already know, Spark has really good support for working with uh, JSON data, if you spell it right. Uh, and now what Spark's actually going to do is it's going to scan over it, figure out the names of all the different columns, figure out their types, and turn it into a table. So now this is something that we can very easily query. However, you know, this is great, but this data is old. This is a couple of hours old, and if there's something going on in my network, I want to know about it immediately. So we're going to need to look at another data source. And we'll call this one streaming. So we actually also forward some of this information into Kafka, so we can get it very quickly, but we can also read from Amazon Kinesis. The nice thing about streaming data is it's accurate up to the minute. So I can know exactly what's going on you know, with milliseconds of latency. Uh, however, the problem here is the retention is limited. I can only query the last couple of hours worth of data, and generally streaming systems are really complex to work with. I have to reason about failures. I have to think about exactly one semantics. I mean, let's take a look at how Spark makes this a little bit easier. So I'm going to do uh, val streaming equals, and we'll do Spark read Kafka. And I'm going to subscribe to a topic called CloudTrail. So this is going to run another Spark job and bring this data back. And you can see the schema looks a little bit different. Kafka actually takes all the data and wraps it in this kind of envelope where we have a key and a value, and these are both binary blobs. And then it actually also attaches a whole bunch of extra metadata, the topic, the partition, the specific offset within that partition. So let's see if we can make this a little bit easier to work with. Uh, normally, I'd have to write a bunch of custom code here. I'd have to use some serializers. I'd have to write some uh, JSON parsing code. But fortunately, one of the key goals of structured streaming was to take this and give us all of the tools of Spark SQL in order to, to kind of munge this data and make it easier to query. So I'm going to say select, and we'll take this value column here, and we'll try to interpret it as a string. So we'll run another Spark job, and it'll come back. And it looks like, OK, this is also JSON data. And in Spark 2.1, we added a bunch of cool new features for not only working with files that contain JSON data, but also working with individual columns that may contain nested JSON data. So we'll just do from JSON. And I'll say we'll parse it using the same scheme as the historical data. And we'll call this record. And so what you'll see is now when the Spark job runs, it's actually going to take that JSON and parse out each one of the individual records. But this actually looks still a little bit different, so we'll just do a slightly more to make it look exactly like the data set above. We'll do record.star, which will take each of those individual nested columns and make them top-level columns in this table. OK, great. So now we've got streaming data. We've got historical data. And here comes the really cool part. It turns out that since these are both data frames, it's very easy for us to combine them. So uh, we'll do. We're going to use structured streaming to take both the data from S3 and the data from Kafka. And one thing we might want to do is we want to take it and convert it into a Parquet data warehouse where it can be efficiently queried by other users. So we'll just do uh, historical union. So we'll just kind of combine these two data frames together into a single new data frame. And what you'll see is this is actually just going to give us exactly the table, but with both of the data sets combined. If I want to write it out, it's as easy as doing uh, write stream, and we'll store it out to Parquet in a folder called Warehouse Cloud Trail. So that's going to actually kick off a streaming job that runs in the background, continually reading data from both data sources, converting it into a highly efficient columnar format. So now we can query it very, very quickly. So that's pretty cool. But it turns out, actually, there's a question I want to know right now. My boss came to me, and he said, hey, we need to figure out what's going on. I just want to make sure that the cloud is secure. Can you investigate the audit logs? And so it turns out we can actually also run ad hoc queries. This is the powerful thing about having all of Spark SQL behind streaming, is you can use it not only for these production ETL jobs, but also for just kind of interactive SQL analysis. So I'm going to just go ahead and do select. We'll just kind of look at the high-level trends. Uh, so we'll do like a count star from CloudTrail. Uh, and I want to look at uh, a specific type of record. So event name equals assume role. So this is when someone else tries to use credentials to assume the permissions of somebody else in the cloud. And the other thing we'll want to do is we'll just bound this. I only want to see this month. 
So we'll do where timestamp is greater than, and we'll just say for February in 2017. And then finally, I want to kind of group this by time so we can kind of see trends as it changed. So we'll do group by window timestamp one day. So this is also going to run in the background and kick off a stream. And what it's doing is it's starting at this moment in time, and it's working its way both forwards and backwards, processing both the new data that's arriving and the historical data with a single query. So I could have done this in batch, but then I would have had to have combined the answers myself. The other nice thing about running it in streaming is we actually get to see incremental results as that batch data is processed. So you can see it's kind of slowly working its way back in time. And if we zoom in, we can also look at some metrics on how this stream is processing. So over here, you see the processing rate. So this is how fast Spark is processing versus how fast data is coming in. And what you'll see is while we're processing that historical archive, we have all of the power of Spark. It's processing millions of records per second. And then once we get to back to the beginning of February, now only this final answer is changing as new data arrives. And the really cool thing here is it's actually switched modes, and we're now getting really low latency results where it's taking you know, only milliseconds to update this answer. So this is very up to date. And if I saw anything suspicious, fortunately everything looks good, we could zoom in and kind of dive and see exactly what's going on in the cloud at this moment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but it's kind of unfair to talk about streaming without talking about long-running production monitoring. And it turns out that's also really easy with structured streaming because Spark takes care of tracking what data has been processed and what data has been committed. So all I have to do is cancel this, and I'll just go over to the Databricks job scheduler, and I can kind of set this to just run exactly the same query, and I'll just tell it to retry if anything goes wrong with the machines on that query. And I can also say, you know, maybe notify me on Slack if anything goes wrong. I'll go ahead and click Run. And what's going to happen is it's automatically going to pick up exactly where it left off. Cool. So um, let me jump back to over here. So that was, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So what you saw was we took historical data, we took streaming data, we parsed them both using Spark SQL, we combined it into one single data set that we can both do ETL and ad hoc queries on. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, I recommend you stop by the Databricks booth. There's going to be engineers hanging out both today and tomorrow who can answer all kinds of questions for you. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is actually all of the code for our production pipelines that we've been building with structured streaming is going to be posted on the Databricks blog. And I've also been posting it on Twitter. So if you want to see like, all of the, uh, the, the gory details, check it out. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you.